about time to start this evening. I guess we're just a little bit ahead of time, but that better to be ahead of time than, than behind time, right? Let's all stand together this evening and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, let's ask God to bless this service tonight. Danny, it's good to see you. I'll tell you what. You ain't kidding. I don't know. I think I think he just got lug bug, love bugged or something. I don't know what it was. You reckon it was? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, uh, Brother Lakey, back there. Would you open our service in prayer, please? Brother Harold, would you? Harold. Brother Marvin, don't be offended, okay? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Father in heaven, we bow before you. We praise you, Lord. We praise your holy name. We just uh, pray that we'll have a good time here tonight and to call upon you and, and a good study from your word. We pray that you'll meet the needs of everyone here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Shake hands, two people. Then let's turn in our song books tonight to number 397. Number 397. Higher ground. Number 397. I said just two people. <laughs> Number 397 tonight. Welcome everybody online. We're glad you're with us tonight. Oh, there's Brother Glidden. Brother Glidden, I'm, I didn't know you. That's all. Anyway, here we go. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining. you take your Bibles and I just, just don't get shook up. I want you to go to the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. And uh, but while you're doing that, look what I got handed to me just a little bit ago. The Wilson Girls. A CD. And uh, Man Alive. They just gave that to me. I'm all excited about it. Can't wait to get home and listen to that tonight. And uh, I'll come back Sunday and I'll either put thumbs down or thumbs up. <laughs> No, it'll be thumbs up, amen. And uh, boy, girls, I'm excited about that. Thank you so much for that. All right, Song of Solomon tonight. And uh, 
the re one of the reasons we may get uh, we may get into a uh, singing a little bit longer a li little bit later is one of the reasons I just sung one song and um, the song of Solomon tonight now I want you to know first of all it said song David said he has put a new song in my heart Amen. and you know I really believe with all my heart that Satan's one of his mainest mainest isn't that good hillbilly stuff <laughs> one of his main goals is to take the song out of you just take the song out of your heart. And David said, he hath given me a new song. And I, I'll tell you, uh, there's, a, there's a battle about that. And I, I really want to encourage you as we look at this book. And I don't, really what I'm doing tonight, I'm preparing a larger message. So I'm going to just work on, work, practice on you guys. But I've got something I'm, I hope the Lord enables me to do about an entire deal about this Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon seemed like it's a book that sometimes is kind of maybe shunned away from a little bit or just considered to be, a, you know, kind of not real spiritual. I don't know what. To me, it's one of the most spiritual books in the Bible. And it deals with something that I think this church and I as a pastor miss and, and am short in. And that is intimacy with God. If we're not careful, we have a Christianity that's all about what we believe, what we believe, what we believe, what we believe, this is what we believe, this is what we believe, this is what we believe, and this is wrong, and this is right, and this is wrong, and this is right. And we fail to enter into the intimacy with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say something to you tonight. Now, listen, we're in a fallen, cursed world. Nothing I know of except God and His Word is ideal. We have, we have the ideals given to us in Scripture but life itself, we're living in a cursed world and we have these ideals and we look at things and think, man, it ought to be that way, but almost times, a lot of times it's not that way. And we, we come across with between the ideals and reality. And so uh, I just want to kind of kick it off this way tonight. Now we're going to do something. I want you to get involved. But uh, let me just start off with this, that this song, uh, Joel, tell me something tonight. How many notes are in an octave? Depending on how you count them. Okay. Because I was, you know, I was wondering, there's seven notes, isn't there, to song or music? I don't know music. Yeah, well, have to tell me. Seven, seven in a scale. Seven in a scale, but eight in an octave. Well, that's what I was told, that there's eight in an octave. So I want you to watch something here. Uh, there are eight octaves. There's, a, there's an octave in this book. And so, and it's, uh, there's eight me's. In this book. And now, I'm going to tell you, what I'm getting ready to present to you guys tonight is difficult for me. It's not, it doesn't fit my spiritual gift. We talked about Sunday morning. It's not, it just doesn't come naturally. I have to kind of press in on it, okay? But there, there is a, there, the, the, the amazing truth in the Bible is this, is the love that Jesus Christ has for his church, irregardless of all of its problems, failures, and that church is made up of individual saved people. And you think about this when it says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now I'll tell you what this, what happens to me, and I don't know whether this is for you or not. What happens is when I am not doing well, that's putting it lightly, that's putting it in a nice frame. When I mess up, when I sin, when I fail, I have a tendency to think God looks at me like I look at other people when they fail. When I look at other people and they fail or I think they really messed up and did wrong, especially if it's toward me, I transpose that into how I think God must look at me when I mess up. But it's not so. And this book is going to show you that. And, of course, the New Testament bears it out. Again, while we were yet sinners, he loved us. And if we forget and remove out of our realm of Christian framework that he loves us with an everlasting love and that his, his whole thing is to desire. Let me just take off with this. God created this world and in that creation, the crown of his creation was what? What was God's crown of creation? Mankind. And in that mankind crown of creation was marriage. 
what on earth did God create man and woman for in marriage? He said, well, to procreate and, and uh, multiply and replenish the earth. Well, that's part of it, but what was, it, what was the deeper of it? What was God showing? What was God demonstrating when he created male and female? You know, and what, bring this into this whole deal about what Satan's doing in our land, in the, in the world. He is totally corrupting and destroying the most beautiful, beautiful thing in the crowning achievement of God's thing. And, but what was, oh, was it just Adam and Eve could have a good time together and live their life together? What was it about? It was, it was showing, it was, a, it was a creative picture of the relationship of Jesus Christ to his bride, the church. And that's Ephesians chapter 5, and we won't go there right now, but you know that. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and so forth. And it goes into all those things about that relationship and that intimacy between Christ and the church. Then you go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and then you go to Revelation chapter 19. Uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so you're running from Genesis 3 to Revelation 19 and he's woven into scripture this picture of marriage. And intimacy when he comes to Song of Solomon he just lifts it up like a mountain peak above the clouds of, of even our, and wants to show us something about himself and his feeling toward you and I, his redeemed. And so I, I'm not going to probably, you know, I'm not really worried about doing a good job about this. I just want to bust into this and I want to get a hold of it because all over the country there's people, you know, their homes are busting up, marriages are either divorced or dead or dry or they're in a apathetic, we'll just endure in each other to the end. <laughs> or it's not fun anymore. I'm bored. I just put up with them. And there's this deadness and this dryness. And I think about it, and I think, so, number one, he said song. Well, you can sing a mournful song, but I don't think this is a mournful song. Okay. So, I want you to be thinking of this term. Now, here's what I want to bring together. This is the Song of Solomon. <clears throat> it is primarily a picture of Christ's relationship to the church. And I got all these little figures here, and I didn't do too swift of a job, but that represents people. The church, okay? It's a relationship of Christ and his church. And in that relationship, his deep, intimate love toward her. And I'm just going to be real honest with you. I think that the American church is missing something so bad that our forefathers had. Because if you want to read deep, intimate, underst spiritual understanding of, a, of Christ's love to the church and the church's love to Christ in response to that and, they, and breaking it down to the individual, you have to almost go back and read old men's writing. You have to go back and read old, you know, the way back 16, 15, 1700, 1800s to, to see the depth and the understanding and the comprehension of it. And to me, one thing, and I'll say this for myself, maybe you don't, but for myself, as I said a while ago, if I'm not careful, I'm focused on the culture and the sin and the problems and my own personal failure, how well, you know, and instead of focusing on that he loves me. That he wants to be intimate with me. He wants to spend time with me. And the raw truth of it is, I don't, I don't understand. The Bible said the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. There's something Hollywood understands. That people want to see intimacy. They want intimacy in their own life, even if they have to almost like hijack it. Now, what they'll do is give a false intimate or a perverted intimacy. You can go back. I don't know. Hey, I'm not. I was born in 53. Don't anybody say nothing. <laughs> but back in the 50s, you had people like Hank Williams. And what did he sing about? Huh? Why don't you love me like you used to do? 
And even back in, as long as you, the radio was there, you know, and I've talked, heard my mother talk about back when radio became pretty apparent in America, and even before that, novels and so forth. And people were constantly drawn to anything that had a reflection or interest about intimacy in life. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. Whether you like it or not, or understand it or not, or believe it or not, God created us with the need for intimacy. And the lack of intimacy is deadly. It's deadly in your spiritual walk with God. It's deadly in your marriage. It's deadly in the church. The intimacy is sacred ground. Okay? So what I want you to get thinking about tonight, what is intimacy? What is biblical intimacy? What is true biblical marital intimacy? And how is it shown and how is it exercised in our life? And again, I don't have all this laid out. To be honest with you, I started this about 5 o'clock this afternoon. And I just couldn't get away from it. I started, I just took off. But uh, let me just get back to this octave and just to show you. Uh, uh, let me just say this here. The song of song. The missing element in current Christianity, I believe, is the intimacy between the believer and his Savior. Do we really believe that he is the bridegroom and that we're the bride? And how do we, how do we experience intimacy with Christ? How do we express intimacy with Christ? What is intimacy? What is our concept of it? What do we think of when we hear the word? And why doesn't sensuality and lust satisfy the, what they think is the intimacy that they're looking for? Hmm. Just some things to think about. And um, now, I'll, I'll I don't know how far I get with this. My mother, I go down there, every, not every Sunday, but, but almost every Sunday morning I go to my mom's. Invariably, I would say three Sunday mornings out of a month, my mom, will, she's 93, and you know, she's just at that stage where she remembers everything when she was a little girl in detail, remembers very little you just said five minutes ago. Probably doing the best of anybody I've ever been around that age, the way her attitude and all this kind of stuff. Three Sunday mornings out of four, she will tell me about remembering when, as a five-year-old girl, that her mother and her dad, every Sunday morning, took a walk together holding hands. They had 15 children. Hard to have intimacy with 15 children. But she said that was their time. And you weren't supposed to bother them. This is our time. And they walked down that little trail, not a road, just a trail back through the fields. She said, back down to the spring. And I know where this spring's at that she's talking about. And she said that was their time. Now, she said, if I got real brave, she said, I'd let them get about three, four, five hundred foot away from me. And I'd run after them. And I'd catch because I knew they wouldn't tell me go back to the house. So, oh, OK, Lorita, you know. And she would go, but she, but she said what stuck in her mind all these years was that they took time to be alone together. I want to ask you tonight, are you taking time to be alone with God? Am I taking time to be alone with God? Those of you who are married, are you taking time to be alone with your spouse. I'm talking, I'm not talking about, oh, well, yeah, we go to bed every night again. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. It may be part of it. Karen and I have had a lot of good talks laying in bed together tonight. Just lay there and visit, talk. Some of the best times in life, just visiting, talking. Joys and the sorrows and the aggravations and the disappointments and the surprises and the joys of life. But I'm going to tell you something. Any marriage that's not having intimacy is in trouble already and waiting for the right problem to come along to get them. And you have to spend time with people to have intimacy. I want to give you these things. Now, we're, we're, let's see here. My goodness, I'm, I'm, how many can tell I'm bump, bouncing around the road and my car's going over here and it's, all right, let's just read together tonight. Guess what we're going to do? There's, by the way, there's eight chapters in the book of Song of Solomon. 
octave. There are eight me's in the Song of Solomon, octave. And the song, yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Whatever you want to do. No. You, you want to play an octave? Would you hit an octave? Do, do an octave. Now, I'm, I should have been paying attention in music class instead of donking off, but anyway. <laughs> you know what's stupid? I hated music class in school. I hated it. But I love music. I don't know. Does an octave crescendo? How, how, can you do a crescendo something that has to do with octave? Isn't that a nice question? Those of you who know music are going on. <laughs> Those of you who know music, since this guy doesn't know music, he's asking me something that doesn't. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, how great our Lord. How many of those members, how great our Lord? Does it not crescendo? See, it brings her crescendo. And. See it? Now, I'm. Boy, I'm going to tell you. See, that, God has built into even music the ingredients of intimacy. And it's, uh, if you want to get the, uh, let's do this, Joel, thank you. If you've got anything else you can come up with, help me, I'd appreciate it. Like I said, I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just up here doing what the Lord told me to do, and here we go. Uh, we're going to do, first of all, there's four of these uh, in the octave that belongs to the bride. There's four that belongs to the bridegroom. We're going to do those real quick, and then we'll come back and we're going to read the book. Are you ready? Chapter 1, verse number 2, it says, now these four belong to the bride. These are the eight octaves of love, and they're all centered on me, okay? It's the Bible, so when it's Bible me, it's okay. But you know why it says me? Because no, God knows you and I need intimacy. And intimacy involves you, not somebody on the TV screen. Not somebody you read about. I can tell you right now, people are dying for intimacy. The music industry understands this so well. Please don't get off on this, but I'm just being honest. You know, I came out of the culture. I mean, I, you can ask my wife. When I met her, I knew every song on the radio. <coughs> Rock and roll, country, didn't matter. I knew it. And she would look at me you know, like, you know, what do you do with your time? Just listen to the radio, you know? But everywhere I worked, I listened to the radio. But I put this on Facebook here a while back. Linda Ronstead sung a song that was from the 50s. She redid it. It's called, When Will I Be Loved? That song made her a multimillionaire. And it was so simple, it was crazy. But the thought, when will I be loved? Everybody else. And when I put this clip on Facebook, at the end of it, I said, the thing you need to realize, you are loved. The wake-up day when you realize you are loved already. Right. There is intimacy available for you in Jesus Christ. But Satan wants you to think that you're not loved, that there's no intimacy for you. Anyway, the first one was, okay, here's the first me. It's a kiss of, of, of salvation or reconciliation. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Down in verse number four, draw me. That's a kiss of fellowship. God wants to draw us to him. First of all, he kisses us, the kiss of salvation. Mercy and truth hath met together. Kiss, the Bible said in the book of Psalms. That's salvation. Okay? You have to run your references on this. Chapter 1, verse number 7. Tell me. That's guidance. That's God speaking to us through his word. Chapter 2, verse number 5. Stay me. That is assurance. That's being grounded. Assured. Okay? Now the next four belong to the bridegroom. Chapter 2, verse number 14, he says there, uh, he's speaking there, he says, let me hear thy voice. That's prayer to God. God is saying, I want to hear your voice. Think about that. 
God says, I want to hear your voice. Boy, please don't tighten up on me tonight. <laughs> Go like that. Think about it. I come to the garden alone. Not with a bunch of other people. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. Not a crowd, but Christ. I get this feeling, Reggie, this may be nice, but I'm not getting very much out of it. Maybe for somebody else. I don't know. Uh, the next one is chapter 4, verse number 8. Come with me. God says, come with me. Chapter 5, verse number 2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh and saith, open to me. Now, that's an important statement because intimacy is the, one of the aspects of intimacy is the ability to be open and honest with each other. Did you know tonight's prayer meeting night tonight? Did you know you will hardly ever hear an intimate prayer request? And maybe you shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't. I don't know. But there's going to be way more things that you will never ask prayer for that you really want to pray about than the ones you mentioned. And that aspect is intimacy. God says, be open with me. Be honest with me. Tell me what's on your heart. I will listen to you. I will care. I am interested in your hurts. I am interested in your disappointments. I'm interested. And I want to be with you in it. And I'm going to be part of it. Now, I don't know about everybody else's, and I'm sure you're not interested in mine. But when I met Karen, you know, I just was, I was just drawn to her. And I'm, but Sister Erlene, I didn't care if we went anywhere. My courtship to her was not about going to the next show or going to the nothing. And she didn't act like with it. We just, if, if we were together, that was it. That was enough. And we would just be at her folks' house there in the living room and just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. I talked, I talked, I talked. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> but she eventually, she eventually began to open up. She eventually began to share what was in her heart, what her dreams were, what her aspirations were, what her hopes were, what her vision of marriage would be, and home and so forth. And I'm going to tell you something. It is exact, that is exactly what Song of Solomon is like. It brings such delight, such joy, such fulfillment of the design of God in creation. And I, I don't know, I, how many understand this is a little bit tough for me? It's a little bit hard for me. It's not easy for me to get on this, but it's true. It's real. Uh, the, let's go to, uh, but anyway, this open to me is intimacy. And then eight, chapter 8, verse number 6 uh, set me, and uh, he said, uh, set me as a seal upon thine heart. Uh, that's where we make him the Lord of our life. And watch it. In the scriptures I gave you a while ago, what did Sarah call Abraham? Lord. What does the church call Jesus? Lord. Set me. The God, my was teaching here that in this, watch this, in this journey of intimacy with him, that we wind up setting him as Lord of our life. Now, don't get off on this. I'm not a lordship salvation guy. He's Lord whether you did or didn't. You know, and all you're making him Lord. You didn't make him Lord. He's Lord. Okay. Now you say, well, I made him Lord of my life. I hope so. But I don't think that's salvation. I think that sometimes comes the reality and the practicality of it comes, but I don't want to get into that, so don't, don't buzz me about that. But that is, that is making him the Lord of your life. See, Sarah, a picture of the church, made Abraham a picture of Christ. Lord, she, she addressed him as Lord. And you know what the Bible says? Obeying him. And so it's all a picture of Christ and the church, but that comes... Now, do you know why... 
I'm not talking to anybody here. I'm not talking to anybody online. I'm talking to somebody out yonder in the world. <laughs> Do you know why a lot of women have trouble submitting? Because there's no intimacy. <coughs> no intimacy. <coughs> Thank you, brother. By the way, these folks are from the long run, right? Down that country. And give me your name again. I'm so sorry. Brother Matt. Brother Matt, Matt and your wife's name? Michelle. Michelle. And he told me that Michelle was saved about 10 years ago. How, how did it come about? Uh, your, your she had heard messages on CD probably just 10 years ago, and she got saved. I didn't even know it. Amen. Yeah, bless I'm so glad you all came tonight. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, it's just like good grief, you know. It's, it's just a blessing. And, uh, but let me say this to you. My submission to, watch this, my submission to my Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, my obedience to him and submission to his righteous, okay, well, is more apt as I, have, as I draw close to him and learn who he is and see who he is and experience who he is than it is for, yes, sir. If we could teach our children to have intimacy with God, Amen. I think our whole goals would be achieved much better. Okay. So, now, I don't want you to miss this part of it either. Now, it troubles me to do this because sure as you get into the Song of Solomon, somebody say, well, I'm not married. Y'all go have a good time. But it's not for me. Well, it is for you in Christ. But there is a correlation between this and between marital intimacy. And uh, just because the world perverts intimacy... No reason we should let it. Amen. And no reason we should avoid it. Right, right. So, we're going to read Song of Solomon tonight. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm going to read a verse, and you're going to read a verse, and we're going to alternate back and forth. Is that fair enough? Yes. All righty, here we go. Look, chapter 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Because the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins lovely. Now, just hang on a minute. I can't help but do this. There's two things God's teaching about. And it's like, you know, oh, mercy, Lord, help me not to say something I shouldn't say. This guy, this guy puts on cologne. That's verse number three. Anyway. <laughs> you want intimacy? Wash, take a shower and put some cologne on. Amen. <laughs> I mean, there is so much. If you read this, if you just go off somewhere and read this by yourself, there is so much here. It is wild. How many of you guys know that your wife likes to be kissed? And guys can... Kissing's fine, but you know. <laughs> she wants to be kissed. <laughs> I tell you, what, I wish I had the ability to do what I need to do anyway. Where was I at? Verse number four. Draw me. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. I am glad that come we, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Shadar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tent. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. While the king sitteth at his table, my spectrum sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is my well beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. 
Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast built us. Behold, thou art fair. How many knows how many times that's been said? Three times right there. He's going to say it three more times in the book. You know what that tells us, guys? Tell your wife she is beautiful. Tell her. She needs to hear it. Amen. <laughs> Did I read verse number 16? Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. The leaves of our house are cedar, and our rafters are fur. All right, now it's going to shift to hit the bridegroom speaking. I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the waters. She's going to speak. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit, fruit was sweet to my taste. He Good grief alive. Can you believe that? That's what Jesus did to us. Brought us to his banqueting house. His banner over us is love. It's not condemnation. This is just wonderful. You need, you need to read this every week just to endure Reggie's preaching. <laughs> to make sure you got your life balanced. Amen. Where am I at? Verse number five. Stay me with legends, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. You ever heard of being lovesick? <laughs> it's all through this book. They're sick of love. I mean, I don't know how to take that, you know. I'm sick of love. No, I'm lovesick. <laughs> I tell you what. All right, which one are you on? Six? That just blows me away. There's a picture of Jesus Christ. To the church. Wow, what a place to be. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows, by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up, nor wake my love, till he please. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the house, sitting upon the hills. My beloved is like a row or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Rapture. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The cloud is on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Verse 7. Behold, the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Please endure my comments. That verse is showing that when you're in love with Jesus and you're having intimacy with Jesus and you're delighting in Jesus, it's springtime in your soul. And you're not worrying about, oh, they raised interest rates three-fourths of a percent today. Did you hear what they said on news today? You're not focused on that. Anyway, I'll stop. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, my God, Amen. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a rower, a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. I will rise now and go about the city and the streets and in the broad ways. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me. To whom I said, sought him whom my soul loveth. It was but a little that I passed by. Now I come near the gates of the city. It was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, and frankincense with all powders of the merchant. Men are the of 
They, are, they all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. He He made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering thereof of purple, the midst thereof being paved with love. Underline that in your Bible, paved with love. Whew. This church ought to be paved with the love of God. Our home's up, man, I just, I'm so wild up on this thing, it's quite crazy. Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with crown, wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals, and the day of the gladness of his heart. I just want to say this is him describing the church in his eyes. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which come up from the washing, where everyone bear twins, and none is barren among them. I want to tell you something right now. He's a looking her over. I, I don't know, boy, I just, I just would encourage you to get a hold of this, how Christ sees us and his interest in us and his love for us. Uh, where am I at? Verse number four. Thy neck is like the tower of David builded for an armory wherein there hang, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Verse number six, until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankenship. Frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee that shall not be seen. Are you kidding me? Thou art all fair. There is no spot in thee. Go to your New Testament. Did you know what the Bible says about the church? When he comes back, without spot and without blemish. How is that? Because we're in Christ. This is so good. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse with me from Lebanon. Look to the top of the manna. That's where your stoves and refrigerators came from. <laughs> from the top of Shinar and Hermon. From the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine? Now, just before you get too excited there, Boaz called Ruth his daughter before he called her his wife. There's a big deal in that. That's big. That's the great, great truth about life in that. But anyway, uh, how fair, no, verse number 10, how fair is thy love, my sister? Did I read that or did you read that? How fair is my, thy love, my sister, must, how much better is thy love than wine, the smell of thy ointments, than all spices? A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Spikenard and saffron, calamus, cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, and with all chief spices. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden, and eat his pleasant fruits. I sleep, but my heart waketh, is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I 
I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him, I am sick of love. If somebody was to ask you that question about Jesus Christ, could you tell them that? What is Jesus above Muhammad? My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His eyes are as the eyes of the dove of doves by the rivers of water washed with milk and fitly set. His hands are as gold ring set with beryl. His belly is, a bright, is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. My beloved has gone, da gone down into his garden to the bed of spices to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. Thou art beautiful, O oh my love, as Terza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines and virgins without number. Who is she that I can't help but stop? <clears throat> Verse number nine has the word one in it three times. He ought to be the one. Amen? Amen? Your spouse ought to be the one. Right. Not the two, not the three, <laughs> but the one. <clears throat> and now tell me where I was at. Huh? I'm reading full speed verse number 10. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? Wherever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Amimadab. I'm sorry. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joint of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel, and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. This thy stature is like to a palm tree, and thy breast to clusters of grapes. I said, I will go up to the palm tree, I will take hold of the boughs thereof. Now also thy breast shall be as clusters of the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples. 
the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved that goeth down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. I am my beloved, and his desires for thee. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. The mandrakes give a smell, and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house, who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine and the juice of my pomegranate. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you stir not up nor awake my love until he please. Set me as a seal upon thine heart. As a seal. How I many of those in the New Testament that were sealed until the day of redemption? For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. Many more shall not quench love, neither can the flood drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house to love, it would not only be content. I hope you don't mind me just a bit. I cannot remember the name of the man, Jacob Astor, on the Titanic. Uh, got his wife uh, to the place where she was getting ready to go uh, on the lifeboat. And uh, they hugged and kissed, and they knew this was it. And she, then she turned around and stepped back out of the lifeboat to her husband and said, and they had been married like, I mean, they were, they were elderly couple. And she said, uh, I'm not leaving you. And they have on their the memorial to them in New York, state of New York, has uh, Song of Solomon 8, 7, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. That's on their memorial because they died together on the going down. She, she could have lived, went on the deal, but she wouldn't. She stayed with her husband. Oh, we have at verse number 8. Where are we at? We have a little sister and she hath no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? If she I am a wall in my breast like towers, then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand, and those that keep the fruit thereof two hundred. Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. Uh, pretty well going to just quit there tonight, and I don't know where I'm going to go with this. May not go anywhere with it. But when I was growing up, <clears throat> Jeremy Hopper's grandpa was L.T. Hopper, and his grandma was Cora, and you could, uh, uh, they went to church every time nearly I was at church, they were there growing up. And these were in the days of true love before bucket seats. <laughs> LT always drove a bench, bench seat, old half ton pickup. And this is honest truth. Karen might say, I saw it. I didn't. I never saw them leave church, but what she was sitting, and these the guys, I mean, they were like 70s and 80s. I never saw them leave church without her sitting beside him scooted over like a 16-year-old girl in love by sitting beside her husband. She did not sit over by the door. She sat beside her husband when she was elderly. Yeah. And um, I used to, the reason I know that so well, sometimes they'd get leave in front of me and I'd catch up with them. They always drove slow. 
And I'm going, LT, quit enjoying her sitting beside you and getting the way there. Now, we're going to close out like this on her. Yes. not going to be anymore. <laughs> when you were saying before, you know, a lot of people would tune you out. I'm not married, so I'm going to tune this out. These are the verses that God gave me several years ago. It says, For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. And that got me through a lot of really hard times. That would be a blessing to maybe some of these girls that need, need it. Mm -hmm. I will tell you something. In our time that we're living in, I don't know how it was before I got here, but in our time, this is a huge battleground in Christianity. A young lady tries to live for God, tries to do what's right, and pretty soon she finds herself left behind, and she says to herself, you know, I tried to do what I thought understood I was supposed to do, serve the Lord, and this is where it got me, and it can become very, very, very difficult. Now, uh, two things I want you to get out of this. One is, try to have a new perspective of God's view of his church and you as a believer. The descriptions, he, thou art all together fair. <laughs> you know? I'm going, Lord, you couldn't be talking about me. But in Christ. The second thing is, if you're here and married, or you get married someday, think about this intimacy with uh, your spouse. And tonight, we're not going to do this, but what I had planned to do, but we're going to do something else, was list... Um, your concept of intimacy, things that to you, because I almost guarantee you that men have a concept of intimacy that is different than women. Doesn't mean either one's wrong necessarily, it's just they're different. And the aspects of that intimacy, and you might do well as a husband and wife to go spend a weekend by yourself and say, you know what, let's write down what we, I want you to write down what you think what you see intimacy as, and I'll write down what I'm doing, let's bring them together and let's weld them together and, and make it, you know, all that it can be in Christ. I'm going to play a deal right now. You got that up, uh, Brother Brett? Now, don't get dicey with me. I'm the pastor. If God don't like this, this you, God, God will handle me with it. Don't you? There's nothing wrong with it. In 1861, a man by the name of Ballou was a major in the, in the Union Army. And they were about a week from, uh, do I need to take this down? Can y'all see it? Okay? You can't see it, can you? Can you see it over there? Can see both of them. You can see both of them. That's great. Okay. Uh, is, can everybody see it okay? Can everybody see one? Do I need to move it? Do I, anybody tell me, okay? You can see it? All right. Sullivan Blue was a major in the, in the Union Army. And he had a premonition uh, about his death. And he wrote a letter to his wife. And the reason I'm playing this is because I want to show you. Now, I'm not saying every man did, but this man was intimate with his wife. And he, he shows you just by the language. I don't know where you would find a man in American culture nowadays that could talk to his wife like this man did. So I hope you'll listen to it. And, and it'll, he'll talk a little bit. He'll start with why he's justified in his mind what he's doing about the war. But then he moves to how this war is going to affect his love toward her and their family and his obligations to them. And he expresses in this premonition uh, intimacy toward her that she could never get away from the rest of her life. Now, I don't know about his theology there's a little bit of stuff in here I don't agree with as far as his concept of maybe what happens after you die that I think is unbiblical. But nonetheless, he's just, you know, kind of surmising like we do at times. So I hope you listen to it. But I want you to listen carefully to this man's intimate talk to his wife.
A week before the Battle of Bull Run, Sullivan Ballou, a major in the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteers, wrote home to his wife in Smithfield. July the 14th, 1861, Washington, D.C. Dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow, and lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I am no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly with all those chains to the battlefield. The memory of all the blissful moments I have enjoyed with you come crowding over me. And I feel most deeply grateful to God and you that I've enjoyed them for so long. And how hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years when, God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and see our boys grown up to honorable manhood around us. If I do not return, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I loved you, nor that when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and the many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless, how foolish I have sometimes been. But oh, Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be with you in the brightest day and the darkest night. Always. Always. And when the soft breeze fans your cheek, it shall be my breath, or the cool air, your throbbing temple. It shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone, and wait for me, for we shall meet again. Sullivan Ballou was killed a week later at the First Battle of Bull Run. <clears throat> the reason I played that, because I felt like it was... There's such a need and especially for our wives to know and to have that kind of intimacy that they're loved supremely, exclusively. And that understanding of that kind of love, I believe, only comes from a scriptural basis of how the Lord loves us. Amen. And I just want to encourage all of us tonight to... Uh, uh, as God would give us grace uh, to, to have intimacy in our homes and our marriages and our in intimacy with our Lord Jesus Christ. Spending time together, laying everything else aside. Let me tell you something, the world's going to go on by. And uh, if you don't tell each other you love each other and talk to each other and spend time with each other, it'll soon be over. Karen and and I'll be married 45 years, a week from Saturday. It just seemed like I was looking at her coming up the aisle the other day. It's honest truth. 
And I'll tell you a funny side of it, the day we got married, July, June the 25th, 1977, I, had a, I milked the cows that morning. I had an auction that day down on, way down south of Gentryville on 95 Highway. It got hotter than blue blazes. It rained and got hot again. I went home and I milked. And uh, <clears throat> I got to church at a minute after seven. I supposed to start the wedding at seven. I got there a minute after. And in honor of our 45th wedding anniversary, I booked an auction on our anniversary. Let's stand and go home. <laughs> I told her, I said, 45 years later, I'm still doing this auction on, you on our wedding anniversary. That's real intimate. <laughs> Brother Helfridge, see you back here somewhere. Would you dismiss us tonight, please, in prayer?